a musical memoir recorded last summer at the Theatre Royal in Plymouth, which follows P.G. Woodhouse as a lyricist in the early years of the American musical theatre, working in collaboration with such great names as Jerome Kern, George Gershwin and Ivan Avello, can be seen in Woodhouse on Broadway tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 here on BBC Two. Theatre Royal Plymouth, a dramatised account of P.G. Woodhouse, the songwriter, as told in his own words. Plum by his family and friends because when he was a child that's what he thought his name was in fact it was Pelham and he never liked it he protested loudly at the font but as his three brothers had been christened Philip Pivodil Ernest Armine and Lancelot Dean he reckoned later he got off pretty lightly with Pelham Grenville the rhyming initials PG by which he is known to the millions of readers who delight in the world he has created a man of simple tastes, with abiding faith in the goodness of heart of his fellow men. Although, it must be said, never overly inclined to mix with them. And so, as soon as he decently could, he retreated from the hurly-burly of city life and hid himself away in a remote village on the furthest tip of Long Island to dedicate himself to his chosen profession, the writing of good English. 86 published novels and 34 plays, musical and non-musical, to which he contributed stories, scenes and lyrics. Musical comedy was his particular dish, and the musical theatre his spiritual home. Exotic productions especially designed for the tired businessman. Plum was just 22 when the theatre hooked him in. And like a cat which has wandered into a strange backyard, he suddenly found himself in a new world inhabited by weird creatures, flitting about in an eerie semi-darkness, like brightly coloured creatures in a cave. He was just beginning to make his name as a writer. He'd uh, published some school stories and had a daily column of topical jokes and verses in the globe. But then one day, he was invited to come to the Old Witch Theatre in London Strand to meet a young American composer with whom it was suggested he might collaborate on some songs. Well, my name is Guy Bolton, by the way. I'm not really in this scene. I sort of sidle on a bit later. Oh, and the chap with the beard and the stick doing the introductions is Ivan Carrill, the Belgian wizard of operetta. Apparently, the girls call him Fabulous Felix. I don't know why. Cherry! Cherry, this is Plum. Plum, Cherry. <laughs> Mr. Woodhouse, Mr. Kern. Hi, how are you? Dealer takes two. And that was it. But then these encounters never do really come up to expectations, do they? I met Sir Arthur Conan Doyle once. How do you do? How do you do? And Goldsworthy? Nothing. Winston Churchill, I met him seven times. Even on the seventh, I could tell that I came upon him as a complete surprise once more. Anyway, when Mr. Kern had collected his winnings, we went to work. And then I really was impressed. Here, I thought to myself, is a young man supremely confident of himself. The kind of person who people turn to when a job of work must be done. But well, right there and then, we knocked out a chirpy little number. My words, his music.
Time passes, about 10 years. Now we see Woodhouse on board the liner St. Louis, en route to New York. Why America, I hear you ask? I've often wondered that myself. Why, for my earliest years, was it America that was always to me the land of romance? It's not as if I'd been intoxicated by visions of cowboys and Indians. Even as a child, I never really became cowboy conscious, and to red Indians, I was definitely allergic. I wanted no piece of them. No, this yearning I had to visit America stemmed principally from the fact that I was an enthusiastic boxer in those days and had a boyish reverence for America's pugilists. I particularly wanted to meet Gentleman Jim Corbett and shake the hand that had KO'd John L. Sullivan. So I headed for New York. New York, by the way, is a large city conveniently sited on the edge of America so that you can step off the liner right onto it without any effort. You can't lose your way. You go through a barn and down some steps and there you are, right in among it. The only possible objection any reasonable chappy could have to the place is that they loose you into it at such an ungodly hour. But I was surprised to find the streets quite busy. People were bustling about as if it were some reasonable hour. Apparently, it's something in the air. Either the ozone or the phosphates or something sort of makes you sit up and take notice. A kind of valley freedom that gets into your blood makes you feel that God's in his heaven and all's right with the world, even if you have got odd socks on. The scene is an apartment on West 68th Street, New York. This is where I come in. At a theatrical bun fight, Woodhouse and Kern meet up again. Woodhouse is now drama critic for the magazine Vanity Fair, and Kern is resident songwriter at the Tiny Princess Theatre. Excuse me. Thank you. So, sorry. Thank you. Oh, hello. Sorry. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm Woodhouse. No, thank you. Sorry. Um, we met before. In England. At the Old Witch? Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. How are you? This is Guy Bolton. You two fellas ought to know each other. Book and lyrics. Bolton used to be an architect, but now he writes plays. Hello. Are you the bully, the pride of the school, or the boy who is led astray and turns to drink in Chapter 16? <laughs> yes, well, we need a lyric writer. It's absolutely a matter of life and death. H have you done any over here? Oh, not yet, but only the other day I missed landing a really big job by a hair's breadth. Somebody gave me an introduction to Lee Schubert, so I raced around to his office. Good morning, Mr. Schubert, I said. I write lyrics. Can I do some for you? No, said Lee Schubert. <laughs> well, just imagine if he'd said yes. I mean, it was as near as that. Yeah, well, we don't do big shows at the Princess. Only 12 girls in the chorus, 11 musicians in the pit, two sets. It's intimate, you see, and positively no hussars or bogus barons or milkmaid duchesses. Yes, Jerry's been working as a sort of musical ambulance surgeon, patching up those Viennese imports for Broadway. And he's absolutely had his fill of producers rushing into his office saying, we got to do this, it was a big hit in Vienna. To which the only answer is, what well, wouldn't be? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, musical comedy is the Irish stew of drama. You can put anything into it, and if all else fails, you can bring on the girls. A trick first tried, let me tell you, by the ancient Egyptians. When one of their pharaohs died, they used to place him in the south-facing pyramid, and then they'd bring on fine wine and food that smelled beautiful. Then they'd bring on the girls, and the girls would do the dance with the veils, and if that old pharaoh didn't sit up and take notice, then brother, he was dead. Yeah, well, come on down to the princess, why don't you? We'll run over a few numbers. Oh, by all means. D don't let's allow, I dare not, wait upon I would. Well, the first Woodhouse, Bolton, Kern collaboration was Miss Springtime. It opened at the Old Forest Theatre in Philadelphia. But when it got to New York, the uh, drama critic of Vanity Fair was caught on the horns of a dilemma. I feel a slight diffidence about waxing too, too enthusiastic, enthusiastic about, about Miss Springtime. Springtime. For having contributed a few lyrical bijoux to it, well, just a few trifles, you know, dashed off in the intervals between more serious work, I am already drawing a royalty from it, which has caused the wolf to move a few parasangs from the Woodhouse doorstep. Far be it for me to boost, for sordid and commercial motives, a theatrical enterprise whose success means the increase of my meat meals per week from one to two. But candor compels me to admit that Miss Springtime is a corker. 
It is simply the best musical play for years. This is a wicked world you'll find, so take my words to heart. Try not to have good intentions to live in. Just try to bear in mind it doesn't matter how you start. So much as how you finish. I knew a little lady once who meant extremely well, but she couldn't. Very good girl on Sunday, not quite so good on Monday. On Tuesday, she was even worse. On Wednesday and Thursday, good night, nurse. She seemed to lose by Friday's sense of what was right. She started out quite mild and meek, but a virtue seemed to spring a leak. I blush when I confess to having been a dramatic critic, for I know where dramatic critics rank in the social scale. Nobody loves them, and with reason, for they are creatures of the night. Has anyone ever seen a dramatic critic in the daylight? You see? Of course, working for Vanity Fair, I had two weeks to prepare my pieces. I pity the poor fellows who cover the new openings for the dailies. Having to get their pieces in by midnight every minute counts. And too often they find themselves on the first night barred from the exit door by a wall of humanity. John McLean, of the New York Journal American, used to employ two methods to beat the gun. The first was to watch the curtain at the top. The minute it starts to quiver, he'd be off up the aisle like a jackrabbit. The other involves anticipating the curtain line. But here too often the dramatist can fool you. On one celebrated occasion, the leading lady took center stage at about five minutes to eleven, and passing a weary hand over her brow, she whispered, And that is all. That was good enough for John McLean. He was out of the theater in a whirl of dust, little knowing that after his departure, the hero entered left and said, All what? And the play went on for another half an hour. Hum, hum, hum. Absolutely top hole news. Listen, I got a job for us. Erlanger wants us to work on a show with him. Erlanger? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Just so you'd know. Abraham Lincoln Erlanger is the great white chief of the New York theater. Uh, all the big managers, Ziegfeld, Comstock, and Savage, were all Erlanger men, booking their plays into his theaters. Do you mean Erlanger actually exists? I mean, you've seen him. What's he like to look at, I mean? Oh, uh, well, he's, he's rather like a toad. Uh, not, not that I've got anything against toads. Oh, nor have I. Many of my best friends are toads. I look forward to meeting him. Ah, yes, but be careful not to say anything disrespectful uh, about Napoleon. I shall watch myself, but why? Well, because he's got a bit of a Napoleon complex. You see, he not only admires Napoleon, he, he actually thinks he is Napoleon. <laughs> Reincarnated? I suppose so, yes. What would happen if I was to make a joke about Moscow? He'd shoot you. 
You see, he keeps a loaded revolver in his desk. They say he did shoot somebody once. Mistook him for the Duke of Wellington, no doubt. He sounds a bit of a tartar. Ah, no, now, you see, Plum, that's our expression, you see. The tartar, meeting a particularly brutal specimen, probably called him a bit of an Erlanger. <laughs> Still, they say he's kind to authors and dumb animals. I paid for Turks, I want to see Turks. Okay, let me hear something good. Me, 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 me. Long ago in Samarkand, such nights I'd know. What is this? I'm trying to save my voice for the opening. You're paid as a singer, so sing. I don't think you understand. When I say I am saving my voice, the voice is in fact saving itself. My vocal cords are in spasm. I don't think I want to hear any more of this. I want to hear some singing. Please. The human voice is a very delicate instrument. You can sing. <laughs> Napoleon was a little guy. They used to call him Shorty. He only stood about so high, his chest was under forty. But when they started joshing him, his pride it didn't injure. He'd simply say. He knew that he had ginger. Napoleon, Napoleon, they thought him quite a joke. Hey, take the slant of the little bill. Was a line of chatter that they used to spill, but they couldn't hold Napoleon when he started into scrap. He was five feet high, but he was one tough guy. And, and we what? take half a nap. There is something insidious about the atmosphere of a musical play which saps the finer feelings of those connected with it. Of course, Erlanger belonged to the lower browed school of musical comedy, which believed you should scrap the plot after the first number and fill in the rest of the evening by bringing on the girls in exotic costumes with a few good vaudeville specialists to get the laughs. His idea of musical comedy embraced trained seals, performing acrobats, buck and wing dancers, and a stage on which everything from a tree to a lampshade could instantly turn itself into a chorus girl. Ah, uh, how I come to put on junk like this beats me. Any connection with the legitimate theatre gave him a pain in the neck. How much am I paying you? Seventy-five dollars a week, sir. Make it a hundred. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, no, 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 on second thought. Make it a hundred and twenty-five. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Oh, and, uh, one more thing. You're fired! Wanted to fire the son of a bitch from a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon was a lady's pet. He liked to have them handy. He used to blow in half his pay on violets and candy. He knew the game from soup to nuts. He worked it on a system. He'd made the queen at five fifteen. By six o'clock she'd kiss him. Napoleon, Napoleon, the ladies thought him great. They fell for him good and hard they did when he came and handed them the old you kid. They were wild up but Napoleon, for his work was full of snap. He was sworn of short, but he was one good sport. And we take after nap. From my earliest years, I'd always wanted to be a writer. I first started turning out the stuff at the age of five. What I was doing before then, I don't remember. Just loafing, I guess. <laughs> my first play was written in collaboration with a boy named Henry Cullimore at the age of seven. He was the senior partner in the enterprise. He was two or three years older than me, which gave him the edge. And he had the fountain pen. <laughs> my contribution was mostly moral support pursuing the same line that I later found to answer so well when I pitched in with Comrade Bolton. He would do the rough spade work, uh, the writing, and I would pop in from time to time and ask, how's it going? And he'd say, okay. And I'd say, fine, and go off and read some Agatha Christie. <laughs> Giving it the Woodhouse touch, I used to call it. I think this is how Beaumont and Fletcher used to hammer out their combined efforts. I'll go with it. Heart of gold. Oh, yearly, old mole. Well, fairly yearly. Go to it, boy. Hard work never hurt anyone. Well, this Bolton, he's the supreme worker of all time and one of the nicest chaps I've ever met. We clicked from the start like Damon and Pythias. 
He does most of the dialogue, and I do the lyrics. Oh, and I throw a plot in from time to time, as required. Well, you know the sort of thing. The hero, having been disinherited by his wealthy and titled father for falling in love with the heroine, the poor shop girl, has disguised himself by changing his necktie and has gone in pursuit of her to a well-known seaside resort where she has disguised herself by changing her dress and is serving as a waitress in the rotunda on the esplanade. The family butler, disguised as a bath chair man, and the father, disguised as an Italian opera singer, have come to the place for a reason which, though extremely sound, escapes me for the moment. They all meet together on the esplanade, each recognises the other, thinks he is himself unrecognised, exeunt all hurriedly, leaving the heroine alone on the stage. It is a crisis in the heroine's life. She meets it bravely. She sings a song entitled, My Honolulu Queen, accompanied by chorus of Japanese girls and Bulgarian officers. Some of these song cues are a triumph of mind over matter. Well, Jerry won't have it. He says, In a scene of college life, you can't have students of today doing swans that deal with piracy or cheese manufacture unless the action of the piece demands such activities. The songs must be suited to the action and the mood of the play. Oh, well, he's the boss, the boneless acrobatic wonder of the keyboard. Generally, how we work is this. Jerry does the melody first, and then I come along and fit the words to it. W.S. Gilbert once said, a good lyricist couldn't do decent stuff like this. Well, I don't agree with him. Not as far as I'm concerned, anyway. If I write a lyric without having to set it to a tune, I always make it sound much too much like a set of light verse. Far too regular in meter. Now, I think you get the best results by giving the composer his head and having the lyricist follow him. Listen to this bit. When Jerry first played me that, I thought it sounded like a lot of twiddly, unimportant notes, followed by the first strong one. Da, 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 da. So I just tagged along after Jerry, and the words sort of fell into place. If every day you sent her diamonds or pearls on a string... You see, I'd never have thought of that if I'd had to write the lyric first. Pearls, if every day, pearls on a string... Dash, it doesn't scan. Oh, well, never mind. That's how I like to work, and to hell with anyone who says I oughtn't to. If every day he sends her diamonds or pearls on a string, if every day she gets a pendant or bracelet or ring, then she will know how very deeply in love he must be when people love each other words are not needed you see if every day he reads the message he sees in her eyes if when he gazes fondly in them she droops them she says, oh dear, oh dear. Then she will know she loved him dearly, whatever may befall. So now you understand why words are not needed. At all. Words are not needed at all. A get-out clause for the lyric writer who's run out of rhymes. But N. Plum was never terribly happy with the soppy love song, you know, the one that comes in the scene on the terrace in the middle of Act One. Plum preferred to take his sentiment with a pinch of salt.
painted on my heart a wound that time can never heal. You woke in me right from the start emotions I cannot conceal. Just let me sketch for you the way. Sad a carrot would be if no boiled beef were near. Think how sad an egg would be if ham should disappear. Think how a sausage's hopes would be dashed if one day it awoke and missed its mast. And what grief a steak would feel if it found that there wasn't an onion all along. Comrade Kern also despised the mushier reaches of ballad writing. He had an aversion to cupids. I remember Oscar Hammerstein once brought him a lyric to fit one of his tunes. It was entitled, Cupid Knows the Way. And that was the first line, wasn't it? Cupid knows the way. Yes, that's right, yes. Of course, it was only Oscar's little joke. Touch on the dangerous side, though, as uh, Jerry had a rather unwieldy sense of humour. Another thing I should tell you about Jerome Kern is he never went to bed. Quite often, my telephone would ring in the early hours. Plum, Jerry. Good heavens, Jerry. Do you know what time it is? Quite early, isn't it? Are you in bed? Well, yes, I was. I've got that first act duet we were worrying about. Get a pencil and paper. You see, he used to keep his telephone on the piano and he'd play the melody over the phone to me while I wrote down a dummy before tottering back to bed. A, a dummy, that's a sort of nonsense version of a melody which shows you where the stresses are. Um, don't call me, I'll call you. Yes, yes, well, this didn't suit you at all, did it? You'd like to be in bed by 11. Well, one of the Georges, I forget which, once said that a certain number of hours sleep a night, I don't recall for the moment how many, made a man something which for the time being has slipped my memory. But you have the general idea, and a German doctor once said that early rising caused insanity. Mm. Ah, well, Jerry got that part of the message, not an early morning person. In 1915, he was booked to sail to England with his producer, Charles Froman, May 1st, departing at noon, which was still an unsociably early hour for Comrade Kern. And although the ship sailed from Pier 54 a few minutes late, Kern was later still. He missed the boat. It was the Lusitania. And that was her last voyage. The liner was sunk by a German submarine which sent two torpedoes crashing into her side yesterday afternoon while the passengers were having luncheon. The great inrush of water caused the liner to list heavily to port so that she could not launch many of her lifeboats. It is believed that only a few first-class passengers were saved as they thought the ship would remain afloat and made little effort to escape. Twelve hundred drowned. Froman's missing. And Vanderbilt. Isn't it odd when one ought to be worrying about the world and all its troubles that all I can think about is that Dulwich looks like winning all its first 11 matches this year. <laughs> but of course, cricket is a great safety valve. If you like the game and you can play it at least twice a week, well, life can never be entirely grey. <laughs> yes, I should perhaps explain that this was a man who loved his public school. I mean, really loved it. Revered his headmaster, the saintly Jilks. The good old Jilks. Kept in touch with the school for years after he left it. Read the magazine from cover to cover. There's a piece here from the trenches by Chidson, L.D. Chidson. Yes, I remember him. He was a funny cove. Uh, our men seem to be settling down here all right and get on very well with the French people. My platoon is very comfortable in a barn and have plenty of straw to lie on. They are keen as mustard and enjoy the life immensely. We have been very lucky as regards casualties. I have not had a man touched yet in my platoon. Others have not been so fortunate. It's rather like a football match where each side is evenly balanced and the game goes now with the one and now with the other. They turned plumb down for the Navy, you see, because of his eyesight. He was rather cut up about it. His elder brother, Armin, was in the Scots Guards. Nightingale. Frank, Nightingale. Killed near Wipers on the Menin Road during a heavy bombardment. He was in the first eleven with me. He was a brilliant slow right arm bowler.
and Farquharson. Reported wounded and missing after the action at Messines. They're starting a fund to send a motor ambulance to the front. One motor ambulance. I suppose I ought to send a check. Sentry for the MCC is all very well, but give me the man who can watch him in a dingy hotel room, lit only by a flickering gas jet, one for each hit, four if it hits the wall, six if it hits the ceiling. To score double figures in such a game is to taste life. The scene is the dining room of Teller's Hotel in Trenton, New Jersey. The patrons of the Trenton Opera House have given the new musical comedy Have a Heart a somewhat frosty reception. And so the producer, Colonel Henry W. Savage, has invited the authors to a script conference. <coughs> Gentlemen, to business. You'll be pleased to hear that Scarborough is a little better this evening. Miss Stansfield has just phoned the hospital. I take a fatherly interest in all my authors. Poor Scarborough. He had a breakdown while we were on the road trying out his play for New York. He had to be carried off the train on a stretcher. <laughs> well, well, the authors you get today seem very brittle. <sighs> Poor Cushing collapsed while we were trying out Sorry. And then there was poor Brown. Now, that was a sad case. Brown? Walter Brown, who wrote Every Woman. One of the greatest successes of my career. Oh, Every Woman, yes, yes, Every Woman. <laughs> he died the night the play opened. That's the second one I've had die on me. Though the other was only a composer. <laughs> oh, well, here today, gone tomorrow. All flesh is grass, I sometimes say. <laughs> now then, act one, suggestions. Oh, no, I, 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 I've had an idea for a gag for Henry. I thought Henry could say, <laughs> I thought he could say, I've told more women where they get off than any man in New York. <laughs> I'll run that one by you again. You see, Henry, Henry's the elevator boy, and he tells people where, where they, where they, where they, where they get off. I see. What do you think of that, George? Oh, 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 I'd like to give it some thought. I'll have to visualize it to see how it affects the dramatic structure. All right, while well, George is giving that some thought, we'll get on with something else. Now, I thought there was a dull spot in scene four. Maybe we could, um, maybe we could do a reprise of Have a Heart in there with some new lyrics. Yeah, put a new verse in. What's that line about the shop girl? A shop girl in the city is deserving of your pity. That's the one. We'll put some new stuff in there. No one wants to hear about a shop girl and her problems. But, <laughs> Colonel, the piece is set in a department store. That's where the action takes place. Okay, but we don't have to have everyone singing about it, now do we? <laughs> Take out all the shop stuff. That's a way to beef it up. A musical for the modern age. 
Let you boys get on with it. I'm for my bed. <laughs> we old fellows have to take care of our health. Miss Stansfield will meet you at 8.30 this morning to collect the new material. She'll have everything uh, typed out and parts extracted by 10, which will give you time to go over everything with George, and you can rewrite anything he disapproves of before you get down to rehearsal. I think that about covers it. Miss Stansfield, shall we go? <laughs> May I ask a question? Certainly. When do we sleep? Sleep? You didn't come here to sleep. You came to get a show ready for Broadway. <laughs> Come along, Miss Stanfield. Do you realize this pondering business of George's is probably the only way the poor devil can get any sleep? Should we stir him, do you think? Uh, um, uh, yes. Yes, I've gone over the whole thing in my head and I see no unsurmountable obstacles. I therefore vote for the change, Colonel. The Colonel has gone to bed. Really? Oh. Oh, well, um, well, I was so absorbed in the problem, I didn't really notice him leaving. Well, the old boy's beginning to feel his age. He's not as wide awake at these things as he used to be five or ten years ago. Well, you keep working on the songs, boys. I'll see you at breakfast. Right. We must stick together. We are companions in misfortune. We are lost lambs. Sheep that have gone astray. Plum, we are in the soup. I can feel a consomme splashing around my ankles. A uh, shop girl oh, in the yeah. city oh, is deserving of your pity. You never go too near the water. Mm, and that, that's a thing you never alter. Uh, the, ca -ca -ca, uh, can't you play it any faster? Or, or, or we're facing real disaster? Um, uh, th this is ever so perplexing. Find a noose to put our necks in. <laughs> You know that in last week's issue of the New Yorker, I was referred to as a burbling pixie. Oh, plum, no. Well, these things take their toll. I mean, you can't go calling a man a burbling pixie without lowering his morale. I mean, he frets. He refuses to eat his cereal. The next thing you know, he's writing thoughtful novels analyzing social conditions. And there you are, you've lost another humorist. The way things are going, the species will soon die out. Already what was once a full-throated chorus has faded to a few scattered chirps. Oh, the earth, um, oh, see, see, see the spiders on the ceiling. Are they quite bereft of feeling? Shall we take a glass of whiskey? Don't you think that's rather risky? <laughs> I think it's what happened to them in their school days that determines all but the most determined of comic writers. If they merely talk amusingly, they are labelled silly asses. Oh, you silly ass. They are despised, scorned, lucky not to get themselves kicked. At least it was so in my day. I got by somehow, possibly because I weighed 12 stone 6 and could box. But most of my contemporary pixies fell by the wayside and have not exercised their sense of humour since 1899 or thereabouts. Oh, can't we leave this till a little bit later? Um, when my eyelids might be straighter. Redo verses five and seven, or you're on your way to heaven. Oh, that's very good, Jerry. That's one in a row. Slum! Don't be a rotter. Entre nous, Jerry had a bit of a bad run at school. Well, he, he doesn't talk about it much. But because he was short, they bullied the hell out of him. His father was a car man, had stables on East 51st Street. They're tough characters on that side of the city. I mean, delightful chaps once you get to know them, but a little on the brusque side. They're apt to shove you in the street and ask you who you're shoving. They use, when spoken to, only one side of the mouth in replying. Ah, LBW. I've always thought it a better fate to be born a bowler than a bat. No batsman can ever experience the supreme emotion which comes to a bowler when a ball pitches in a hole off point's feet and whips into the leg stump. It is one crowded moment of glorious life. Oh, let us fly without delay into the country far away We're free from all this hair and strife Oh, go and live the simple life How clear the voice of nature calls Oh, go and get some overalls And get the latches of an act You read at night when things are slack Let's build a little bungalow in Quad In Yapping or in Hicksville or Pachon Where we can skip the scent and breathe And pluck tomatoes from the trees Where there is room to exercise the dog
writing musical comedies is rather like eating salted almonds. You can always manage one more. Every time the partners got together, we vowed to go on the musical comedy wagon. But somehow we found ourselves in Erlanger's office and there was a box of cigars on the table and Mr. Siegfeld in his usual chair by the window and Mr. Erlanger would say, wouldn't it be fun to get together some theatricals? And Mr. Siegfeld would say, yes, wouldn't it? And then through the haze, a voice would coo, sign here, boys. <laughs> Before they knew where they were, the boys were signed to do a colossal review at the Century Theatre. But that was the season we set a mark for other authors to shoot at by having five shows running simultaneously on Broadway. And the hottest ticket in town was Oh Boy. Oh Boy. Oh Boy, yes. No one objected when we bumped up the prices of the top seats to $3.50, the highest prices in town. We also had four companies on the road, one doing Boston, one Chicago, a third the one-week cities, a fourth the one-night stands. The critics were in raptures. One even burst into song. This is the trio of musical fame, Woodhouse and Bolton and Kern. Better than anyone else you can name, Woodhouse and Bolton and Kern. Nobody knows what on earth they've been bitten by. All I can say is I mean to get lit and buy orchestra seats for the next one that's written by Woodhouse and Bolton and I've always liked the sort of songs you hear so much today Called when it's something or other time in some place far away Oh, tulip time in Holland, a pleasant time must be while summer strong for apple blossom time in Normandy. But there's another time and place that makes a hit with me. When it's nesting time and crack push, we will take a little class. With wealth along the rack, where there's food. fate went to work. As Shakespeare, who often hits off a thing rather neatly, once said, this is the state of man. Today he puts forth the tender blooms of hope. Tomorrow blossoms and bears his blushing honors thick upon him. The third day there comes a frost, a killing frost. And when he thinks, good easy man, full surely his greatness is a ripening, nips his root. Cain's storehouse, like so many monuments of the past, no longer exists. One isn't quite sure now what happens to the scenery of shows that have bombed. You'll probably have to cart it out into the wilderness somewhere and set light to it with a match. But there was a time when Cain's storehouse was an institution, a sort of Sargasso Sea into which the wrecks of dramatic Hesperuses automatically drifted. 
or you could call it a morgue. And to this morgue it was inevitable that sooner or later the partners should contribute a corpse or two. They contributed three, one after the other. The first and the worst was the Rose of China. Oh. Comrade Kern, it had to be said, had absolutely no hand in this farrago which owed its genesis entirely to too much rich food, too much potent liquor, and the heady effect of oriental music on top of these. The consumers of that food and liquor were yours truly, and the music was that of Armand Vexy, rendered by himself in the oval room of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, where he was shed or kissed. Now, a word of advice here to all aspiring young authors. Never have anything to do with a play which has a title like The Rose of China, yes. or The Willow Pacan Pite, or Mi Veli Soli. In fact, avoid Chinese plays altogether. Much misery may thus be averted. What happens when you write a Chinese play is that before you know where you are, your heroine has gone cute on you, adding just that touch of glucose to the part which renders it unsuitable for human consumption. It is the opinion of most competent critics that, with the possible exception of Grandma's Diary and Abe's Irish Rose, the production East is West was the greatest mess ever to hit the American stage. But this opinion is only held by those who did not see the Rose of China. The Rose of China was one of those theatrical entertainments which had the audience looking at that cheering notice at the top of the program, this theater may be emptied in three minutes. <laughs> Look around you, choose the exit nearest you, walk, do not run to that exit. Plum, we must have been crazy. At least six months must elapse before we even consider writing another show. The, the reservoir needs to refill itself. The managers will come pleading to us with their contracts, but we shall be firm, brave, and, and the other word, the other word. Adamant, 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 adamant. Adamant. We shall say, sorry boys, but nothing doing. We are refilling the reservoir, we are husbanding our efforts. Sorry to disappoint you, old chaps, but in a word, no. Hey, Wodehouse Bolton, just the boys I was looking for. You want to write a show for me starring W.C. Fields? Yes, brother! <laughs> On an island far away, so the old world legends say, sat wicked sirens all day long, singing their sweet deceitful song. Mariners came sailing near, heard that song so soft and clear, answered the call that lured them all, and upon the reef came straight to breathe. Now, in the days when theatre managers lived on raw meat, it took some ingenuity to sell them on an idea or a script. Managers don't read plays, you see. They can't. 
attention span of a gnat. Arch Selwyn does fretwork in his office. Harry Frazee uses meetings with writers as an opportunity to clear out the drawers of his desk and throw away empty whiskey bottles and appeals for charity. Colonel Savage, on the other hand, invited us onto his yacht, the Dorinda. A nice leisurely cruise, we thought, in which we can discuss, without distraction, our ideas for the W.C. Field show. Oh, good evening, gentlemen. Good Ooh. evening, sir. Hello, Colonel. Good evening, Colonel. <clears throat> oh, yes, Colonel. Well, we've roughed out a tentative idea for the Bill Fields play, Colonel. Oh? Well, let's hear it. Right. Well, Bill Fields is a pawnbroker, the last in a long line. His family have been pawnbrokers for centuries, and one of them, oh, ages back, was the fellow who loaned the money on Queen Isabella of Spain's pearls when she pawned them uh, to finance the Christopher Columbus expedition. But, in return, she signed a bit of paper saying that he could get 10% of whatever Columbus discovered. And, of course, Columbus discovered America. So, there is Bill Fields in the quite extraordinary position of having a cast-iron claim on 10% of America. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is terribly good. Mm. Oh, and then they get mixed up with some crooks, and crooks. then... Crooks? Why must there always be crooks in these things? Thematic archaism. And just as I was beginning to think you were groping towards something esoteric and foreign to the debauched conception the theatre-going public has today. Colonel, how do you like your brine herring? <coughs> oh, it's fine. It has, uh, nuances. If you gentlemen excuse me, I'd like to get back to the bridge. I want to get through the Raritan Canal on the incoming tide. You did bring some dungarees with you, did you not? Uh, no. Uh, well, we can probably fit you up with some from the wet locker. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't ask Jerry long. He's such a little feller. Why should we need dungarees? To work the locks. Oh. How many locks would there be, exactly? Twenty-nine on the New Jersey Canal system, and then you get really busy. Tell me, Palmer, you seem to know a great deal about the theatre. Well, of course, I'm a playwright. Oh. I thought you were a cook. Well, when I say cook... No, 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 no. The Colonel's got a play of mine which he's going to do as soon as he finds the right star. It's called Ophelia. Hamlet, from the woman's angle. Uh, just how long has the Colonel had this Ophelia of yours? Well, let's see. This is my fifth trip to Florida on the Dorinda, so well, I think we just... Did you mean to say that we're going to Florida? Well, yes, didn't the Colonel tell you? No, he just suggested a cruise. We haven't got any clues for Florida. But you're not going to Florida. He'll put you ashore as soon as you work the last of the locks. The scene changes to the Princess Theatre. Oh, by the way, uh, the W.C. Fields play didn't happen. It just sort of evaporated in a haze of Scotch mist. But now, a plot is afoot. Producer Ray Comstock is planning to steal two lovelies from the Ziegfeld Follies and put them into our show here at The Princess. The writers meet the girls. Miss Marion Davies, Miss Justine Johnson, Bolton and Wodehouse. Hey, but don't waste your time with them. They're only writers. I'm the man that's going to make you into stars. Yes, but, but, but they'll have to write the words I'm going to say. The girls are ready to sign up with us, provided they get parts. Oh, parts you shall have, the very best of parts, the first fruit of our collective brain. And names, not just first girl and second girl. Oh, for goodness sake, of course you'll have names. Yours, for example, is, uh, uh, uh Polly Andrews. Is that a pun on Polly Andrews? No. Well, it sounds like it. What does Polly Andrews mean? Well, it means the same sort of thing for, for, a, for a girl as, as, as polygamous does for a man. Oh, you're too well educated. I just say snuggle hound. I hear that's what Ray is. I hear he's the worst old snuggle hound on... Oh, I've got a patch on Guy. A flick of the finger, a broken heart. That's Guy Bolton. Really? Oh, Ray. Why, he once kissed a girl on Broadway, and she shot clean up to the top of the Woolworth building. Well, you don't say. I'm telling you, just closed her eyes with a little moan and floated up, up, and up. And he looks so good. You married, Guy? Not yet. But are you? Oh, um... Oh, well, no, he, Plum, he's terribly happily married, and uh, he's constantly telling me I should be, too. Oh, <laughs> you get married, and first thing you know, you have a b b baby, and then the next thing you know, in a few months' time, you got another... B baby and then oh not to say that i don't like babies i like them very much i'm just glad i haven't got one now i i want to be a comic boys write me some funny stuff well that's what we're here for <laughs> But full of style, her figure slim and swell. To every man that wandered by, she pulled the feet of our eye. And everyone observed with 
Couldn't stand by any means Reproachful stormy farewell scenes To such coarse stuff she would not stoop So she just put poison in his soup Went out with Cleopatra Men always made their wills They knew there was no time to waste When the gumbo had that funny taste They take her hand and squeeze it Say, Mama, oh, you can But they never like to start to pee Scores of men got injured in the rush. They'd stand there waiting in a line and watch her agitate her spine. It simply used to knock them flat. Oh. <laughs> when she went like this. You think Ziegfeld would have declared war when we pinched his girls? But no, there are always plenty more waiting in the wings, and Ziegfeld held regular private auditions. And the old lecher always insisted on seeing the raw material. Ziegfeld was a strange monster. He lived in fantasy. He hated clocks. He never paid bills. Everything he detested involved reality and the bitter truth. Everything he loved involved sumptuous and gorgeous lies. He communicated mostly by telegram. The Blake in Chicago, book and present shape has not got a chance except for the critics, but the public know, and I've stopped producing for critics in empty houses. The present lady... Ziegfeld asked us to write a show for him. Well, I say asked us to write. He, in fact, locked us in an office above the Century Theatre and said he'd let us out when we'd written it. This was a review for 1917, but we decided that it should have a plot, a real, consecutive, coherent story. The first jarring note was struck when we discovered that the principles already contracted included three classical dancers, three Spanish dancers, an acrobatic dancer, 48 buck and wing dancers, a trained cow, and Harry Kelly and his dog, Lizzie. <laughs> he argued with Ziegfeld that this might not make the most balanced cast for a plotty show, but he urged us to go ahead and fear nothing. Scarcely a day went by without the addition to the cast of a new juggler or snake charmer, and the gallant little plot swallowed them all as a frog swallows flies, until finally, in a heroic attempt to absorb a performing seal, it burst and died, regretted by all. Critics have often commented on the atmosphere of somber gloom which permeates much of Woodhouse's writing, like the smell of muddy shoes in a locker room. And they've wished that there was not quite so much of the Russian spirit of helplessness and pessimism about them. But had they known that this is the joint author of the show that was to become Miss 1917, I think they would have understood and sympathized. I stayed at the sickbed of Miss 1917 until the end. It expired after just 30 performances. Plum retreated to his bolt hole on Long Island and the arms of Ethel, who stood between him and the world. Plum was her third husband. The first died of a rare tropical disease. The second threw himself from their apartment window in New York. Plum married Ethel after a, a whirlwind courtship on Coney Island. She immediately took charge of his affairs, gave him a monthly allowance, tiresome clothes, which he hated to wear, and sent him off to work in the city when the sun was shining on the garden. In the winter months, they'd get an apartment in New York, and Plum pleaded with her to get one on the ground floor. Well, I never know what to say to the lift boy. Well. So, she got them a studio in the Beaux-Arts building, rented it from an artist, Leon Gordon. At the time, we were working on the book of Oh Lady Lady, 
We had the main story mapped out, but we needed some sort of subplot with some kind of comic potential in us. Oh, I've run out of tobacco. I'll get some. Yes, I wish you would. I ought to stay here. Ethel's having a lady decorator to come in and um, fix that settee there. You see, it's a curious hybrid piece, isn't it? Kind of early American top and Victorian legs. Yes, Ethel's having it done over. She's always having things done over. I'd leave them be, but then who am I to say? Ethel is rather like Napoleon. She expects her orders to be carried out without a hitch. Doesn't listen to excuses. Now, in the lobby, who should I bump into but Audrey Munson, New York's most sought-after artist's model. Her body was all over town. Guy, darling. Audrey, sweetie, hello. Mm. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm making the rounds of the artist studios, seeing if I can drum up a little trade. In my line, you've got to make the most of what you've got while you still got it. <laughs> well, I think you've still got it. Best of luck. Leon Gordon. One B. So the old legends, so the old legends say, on an island far away. Oh, yes, do come in. Yes, the sofa's over there. <laughs> on an island I'm Audrey far Munson. Away. Do you have any work for me? Oh, yes, rather. Quite a lot, too, if your figure's all right. Well, my figure is generally supposed to be all right. I think it's the legs that are the problem. You need have no anxiety about those. Listen, how much do you charge altogether? You want the altogether? Oh, well, while I remember it, the seat needs to be covered with a piece of chintz in case the legs show too much sign of wear and tear. <laughs> I guess I'm being kidded. You fooled me at first with that dead pan stuff. Do you have a screen? Oh, I don't think so. Well, should we have, do you think? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. I can manage. Do you want to work now, right away? Yes, yes. I really do have to work. Yes, yes. Fine. So Anyone in here? No, no. I'm all on my own. I'll only be a minute. On an island far away, sat, sat old, si sat old sirens, sat sirens all day long, <laughs> singing something, something song. Yes, all right. Yes, do come in. Yes, the door is open. Good morning. Sat I've come to the... <laughs> what is this? Perhaps it would be more convenient if I were to look in some other time. Uh, no, uh, no, I, I say, no, just a minute. Here I, we are. Listen, oh, hello. I, Here we are. Four ounces of the best shag. Take it out of our next royalty check. I say, old boy, I have a problem. Ooh. One that I think calls for sophisticated handling. Oh, yes. You see, there's a girl in there. A girl? Y yes, 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 it's a girl, all right. While you were out, she came in, and after exchanging a few perfectly civil remarks, she, she took her clothes off. What are you wishing? What do you mean, took her clothes off? Yes, well, I thought it seemed a little odd at the time. But, but the problem, as I see it, is this. I mean, bearing in mind the fact that Ethel is due to come through that door at any moment, what do we do for the best? Sky! Audrey! You should have told me Leon Gordon was a nutty Englishman. No, but, but he's... Well, I mean, he is a nutty Englishman, but that's not Leon Gordon. P.G. Woodhouse. Oh. I thought you wanted me to pose. <laughs> No, 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 no. I thought you'd come for the settee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah! That's Ethel. And this is trouble. Bolton to the rescue. I... Uh, that, that, that's it. That's it. That is our comedy scene. Uh, for, 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 uh, for, for the first meeting of Bill and, and the soubrette. So we've decided that Bill is a, 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 an, an artist and he leaves Hale with instructions about the city and then in comes Audrey, who's a model. Art who's artist, an artist model, that's right. Artist, and, 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 and then we can set the thing in, in Bohemian Greenwich Village and, and the whole thing will, will write itself, complete with song cues. <sighs> so you see, writing musical comedies is as easy as shelling peas. There's nothing to it. You just take a plot off the shelf, dust it lightly with some songs and some gags, and top it off with a large dollop of charm. Ibsen, it is not. Real life isn't allowed to intrude. There's no sex, there's no villainy, and the only characters who are allowed to behave badly are maiden aunts. Of course, the real drama was going on behind the scenes. And all too often, Guy Bolton would be in the thick of it. He was once chased through the corridors of a train by a chorus girl's husband armed with a gun. Guy married young. He kept on marrying, springing from blonde to blonde, as the chamois of the Alps springs from crag to crag. <laughs> he was plagued by his ex-wives. They made noisy scenes at first nights and tossed bricks through hotel windows. I tried to persuade him to settle down to a tranquil life of fruitful endeavor, but to no avail. But Plum, I can't help it. I, I, I'm like the chap who didn't want to make his choice until he'd walked the entire length of the counter. 
Meanwhile, you're the sort of chap who, when he hears a sharp knock on the bedroom door, instinctively jumps out of the window. Now, is that a system? When you find you're scared by sudden noises, when you bite your tongue and jump 11 feet, just because some lovely afternoon in summer, a birdie in the treetop says, well, you've simply got to pull yourself together. Of course, it may not It may just be nerves or liver. No, Bacardi or Green River. Still, it sort of makes a fella stop and think. Ah, and yet sometimes I got quite sentimental and thought that there could be no happier life than just to settle down in some nice suburb with half a dozen kiddies and a wife. I've met a lot of fellas who have done it and they tell you it's fine and try to grin. But you see, they've all been stunned themselves for devils so they want to let some other fella in. Oh, really? And I visited those earthly paradises but it somehow happens every time I come. Little Percy's having fits upon the hearth rug. And little Willie aches inside the tum. And then you're told that little Rolo has the measles. And little George has drunk up all the ink. Well, perhaps they're right to say no blisses. Half so wonderful as this is. Still. It sort of makes a fella stop and think. The more Plum had to do with women, the more he really thought there ought to be some sort of law. You see, you must remember that Plum and I had spent all these hectic years wandering in a world of beautiful women who thought their main purpose in life was to be, I don't know, a sort of animated champagne vat, but who left no mark on Plum except for the vigor and the frequency with which they kicked. Some had kicked about their love songs, some about their duets, some about their exit lines, others about the lines of their second act frocks. But they had all kicked, with the result that women had become to plumb not so much a tender goddess or a flaming inspiration as something to be dodged, tactfully if possible, but if not possible, by open flight. No woman yet has understood we try our hardest to be good but something always seems to interfere no gratitude our attitude was ever known to win yet still we pass We do our best as we have said The straight and narrow path to tread Ignoring temptations fate may send But of snares the world has plenty meant To trap a man of sentiment And one is sure to get us in the end Oh, it's a hard, 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 hard world tries to be wise and remain aloof and chilly but along comes something feminine and frilly so, so what's the use he will run loose though he does, does the best he can it's a hard 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 world for a man the history books are full of tales of fellows who were perfect whales at virtue when they started their career. Sir Lancelot to glance a lot at girls was ever known till he met Guinevere. Mark Antony, the record show, was like a chunk of driven snow, but Cleopatra sent the poor man wrong. And King Henry was a paragon Till Catherine of Aragon And six or seven others came along Oh, it's a hard, 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 hard world for a man 
He'll be good if he could, but he can't, and there's a reason. For the skirts are getting shorter every season, so what's the use? There's no excuse, though we do the best we can. It's a hard, 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 hard world for the man. Well, Ethel soon had him house trained. Used to call her Bunny. But believe me, she was not soft and cuddly. She could check a charging rhinoceros with a well-bred stare and a raised eyebrow. <laughs> she also disapproved of me. I think she thought I was a bad influence on her plumbing. She slept badly and wandered through the apartment at night, continually polishing and re-polishing tables, planning, I suppose, to turn the place into a sort of miniature blenheim. <laughs> a mixture of Mistress Quickly and Florence Nightingale with a touch of Lady Macbeth thrown in. Her manner towards Plum alternated between that of a nurse towards a child who was not quite right in the head and the owner of a clumsy but likeable young dog. They had no sex life. Plum told me he'd contracted mumps at school, which rendered him impotent. He was closest of all to his stepdaughter, Leonora. He used to call her Snorkels, and they were like children together. I sometimes worry about my mental development. I appear not to have progressed a step since I was 16. With world convulsions happening every hour on the hour, I appear to be still the rather backward lad I was, brewing tea in my study in Dulwich. My only concern, the outcome of a rugby football match. After the war, he wanted to go home to visit the old school. On the roll of honor at Dulwich College, there are the names of 560 boys. They timed their lives beautifully, didn't they? The school scored five VCs. I hope when I go back to England, I shan't be shoved in the jug for not helping to slug the Kaiser. I, I registered in the draft over here, of course, aged 103, sole support of wife and nine children, totally blind and all the rest of it, but ought I to have registered in England? Should I have gone back? After the war, things were different on Broadway, too. Well, it's hardly surprising. These things tend to take their toll. There was an ominous headline in Variety. Musical comedies have had their day. And its theatre critic noted that the best offering of the New York season was as slapdash and contrived as all the other shows on Broadway. Have you ever been mortified by the unexpected refusal of your dog to accept the proffered morsel? Well, that's how authors feel when the public, who've been pawing and whining at them for another plate of prime chunks, turn away and leave it untouched. <laughs> it was real backs to the wall time. The out-of-town tours were reduced to a two-week tryout. And always the producer at your elbow, chewing two inches of unlighted cigar and muttering, there ain't no doubt, boys, but what it's gonna take a lot of fixing. Mm. To make matters worse, Comrade Kern was becoming slightly more eccentric. No longer the quaint, amiable character we once liked and admired. When he came to rehearsals, a cloud settled over the chorus. Come on, guys, we got work to do. Hey, yeah, grand and a glorious feeling when the moon is dead and bright. What we do when nothing goes wrong from the breakfast gone till we go. Can we decide when nothing goes wrong from the dinner gone? See, it doesn't make sense. We had to go over nothing goes wrong from the breakfast gone. When we go to bed at night. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, don't play that stuff. Play something good. You know, I wonder where my baby is tonight. Hmm? Dum, dum, dum. That song gets me right here. I've just been divorced. So can you blame me for wondering? The grand and the glorious feeling when the oh, for goodness is goodness. there and... Do you know a number called the, the Horse with the Lavender Eyes? It drove us from the plaza all the way down to the church. Dawn said that the horse had lavender eyes. So we sung that song all the way down the avenue. Dawn O'Day. That was her stage name. It's 
pretty, isn't it? Just a second. A hundred dollars? What's that for? For him. He plays okay, but he picks out rotten numbers. Now we're entering the hooch age, and the spirit that gave rise to bathtub gin was the same devil-may-care quality that accounted for flagpole sitters, marathon dancers, and the bull market. People talked faster, laughed louder, and lost their tempers more readily. I believe that theatre-goers will demand better musical plays when prohibition comes into effect. They just won't be satisfied with the jazzy types of entertainments that are holding the boards in many Broadway playhouses. I write music with a view to having it appreciated by people who come to the theatre without alcoholic stimulation. I'm not insinuating people come to the theatre in that state at the present time. I merely believe people will be more exacting after July 1st. My music doesn't reach the public in the way that I wrote it! except in the theater. But these jazz orchestras distort it into something unrecognizable. You don't like jazz, Mr. Kern? What jazz? There's no such thing as jazz music per se. At least nothing that could honestly be called original or characteristically American. The gypsy orchestras of Hungary knew and used such methods hundreds of years ago. But they were artists and knew when and how to apply these methods. I am trying to apply modern art to light music, just as Debussy and those men have done to more serious work. I want to write a symphonic poem with choreographic accompaniment. I guess people will laugh themselves sick. Nobody's going to take a man's work seriously when they've been dancing to one of his foxtrots. Then we had a real falling out. Kern didn't want us to cast Dorothy Dixon in the new show we were doing for Ziegfeld. He said she was singing flat. He sent us a litigatious cable. If you cast Dixon, you are imperiling my property. Yes, well, we did cast her, and she was damn good. Kern sulked at the back of the stalls, wouldn't speak to anyone during rehearsals. Well, he was living in the past. His music was beginning to sound dated. Well, if we can't have Jerry, then who else is there? Uh... There's that uh, rehearsal pianist at the Century Theatre. Oh, I know the one. He can make a piano sound like a whole jazz orchestra. What's his name? George Gershwin. Well, perhaps that's what we need. A change in the bowling. Bring on the pride of the remove. Of course, with George, you got Ida. The brothers were a songwriting team, impossible to prize apart. But we have to thank Ziegfeld for pairing Plum with George for one day in 1928, producing the only song with Woodhouse words Gershwin music. When your eyes look into mine, there's something they would say. Is it no or yes? Surely you can guess. Look again and quickly, then you're deaf to fly away. If there's secret you tell, words are needed as well. 
say so, say you love me, not about me in your heart. Pining, I'll be pining till you do. Say so, don't resist me, say you've missed me from the start. Say so, for I pray so that it's true. There are just three little words I'd sigh for, crazy about them. Three little words I'd sigh for, can't live without them. Say so, turn the gray sky to a gay sky, ever blue. Say so, I should say so, I love you. While we were working with the Gershwins, Jerry telephoned me and asked if he could use an old lyric of mine in a show he was doing with Oscar Hammerstein. It was something we'd written ten years before, and it had had the distinction of being dropped from two shows before they reached Broadway. So I said, go right ahead. Well, we were always doing that sort of thing in those days. In return, he gave us the rights to redo one of the old princess shows in London with another composer. Well, I think Jerry got the best of that deal. His little show was called Showboat. And the plum lyric was the song which kept him in pipe tobacco for life. I used to dream that I would discover the perfect lover. Someday I knew I'd recognize him if ever he came around my way. I always used to fancy then he'd be one of those godlike kind of men with a giant brain and a noble head like the heroes bold in the books i read but a long came bill who's not the type at all you'd meet him on the street and never notice him his form and play golf, or tennis, or polo, or sing a solo. Oh, no, he isn't half as handsome as dozens of men that I know. He is not tall and straight and slim, and he dresses far worse than Ted or Jim. And I can't explain why he should just be the one From 1926 to 1928, together or singly, we had 19 opening nights in London and New York. I wrote a show for the Astaire's, Fred and Adele. You also fell in love with Adele. Uh. But she married a duke and went off to live in a castle in Ireland. Fred Astaire struggled on for a while without her. Finally, he threw in his hand and disappeared. There was a rumor he turned up in Hollywood. 
Then we thought we'd become producers ourselves. We dusted off a little thing from our collected bottom drawer, entitled, appropriately enough, The Little Thing. It got bigger every day. Yes, the budget was hovering around $100,000. But what was $100,000? Plenty of smart lads were making that every other day down on Wall Street. Well, I suppose we could always... Uh sell those securities and deposit that hundred grand in the bank? No, 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 there's no need to do that yet. My broker says the bull market's good for another six months. I mean, it does seem a pity to pull the money out when every day you keep it in there, it keeps on earning more. Mm. Extra, extra, Wall Street lays an egg. October the 24th, 1929, the floor gave way. Auburn Auto, in which we both had substantial holdings, dropped 60 points by the close. After that, things became a bit of a blur. One would not have been surprised, looking over one's shoulder, to see a brace of those peculiar creatures with the unnecessary number of heads, as described in the Book of Revelations, flexing their muscles before closing in for the kill. <laughs> Do you realize, even if we'd cleaned up with the rose of China, today we'd be no better off. Very solly got no lolly. <laughs> How do you stand? Oh, the books balance exactly, the black and the red. They did a thorough job on me. Well, they didn't get all of mine, thanks to Ethel. Good. How about taking some of mine till the tide comes in again? <laughs> no, it's all right. Got enough for a cab fare. I suppose... I suppose this means... I'll have to pay for the drinks. Come on, then. And then we went to Hollywood. Guy? But that's another story. <laughs> Bad news. Go away. Come around. Someday in March or May. I can't be bothered now. My bonds and shares may fall downstairs. Who cares? Who cares? I'm dancing and I can't be bothered now. Music is the magic that makes everything sunshiny. Dancing makes my troubles all seem tiny. When I'm dancing, I don't care if this whole world stops turning, or if my bank is burning, or even if Romania wants to fight Albania. I'm not upset, I refuse to fret. I'm up among the stars, on earthly things I frown. I'm throwing off the bars that held me down. 